Welcome. My name is Joe Paprocki. I'm the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press, and welcome to this webinar, Listening for God's Voice Within, a webinar with Father Mark Thibodeau. As you see, he's on our screen. He's ready to uh, talk about this wonderful topic, which is uh, so appropriate for the season of Lent as well as uh, year-round. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and all of you who are uh, participating will be receiving a, a link to that recording within a day or two, and uh, the link will be made available um, on our website. We'll tell you more details about that in uh, a few moments, uh, but as well, we're going to start uh, chatting in just a few minutes with Father Mark. I wanted to let everyone else know that we're in webinar format, so you won't uh, be able to unmute yourself or turn on your camera. Uh, it's just, you're stuck with me and Father Mark uh, throughout the, the course of this presentation. Uh, but thank you for being here. And uh, please use the chat feature to introduce yourself. We've had a, a long litany of um, uh, places where people are from, and we thank God that we have this technology to connect in such a profound way with people all over the world. Please use the Q&A feature to uh, put in any questions that you have for Father Mark. And a little bit later on, uh, my colleague Denise will pop back on to uh, uh, offer some of those questions for Father Mark as we put them on the spot, to totally unscripted, uh, you know, which is really most of this webinar, but we do have an outline that we're gonna follow. But uh, let's go ahead and, and get started with our uh, chat today. I wanna introduce you to Father Mark Thibodeau, uh, who I had the pleasure of uh, seeing uh, back in January. I was in New Orleans and uh, got to sit in on a, a presentation uh, he was doing down there. And it was just wonderful, Father Mark. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome, thanks for being here. Well, it's wonderful to be here. And, and, and I just wanna say that I've just loved uh, my relationship with Loyola Press, which has been uh, oh, quite a few years now, out of something like 15, 20 years now, yes. which is marvelous. And uh, I've even gotten to go to Chicago and, and visit the offices and everything. So it's just nice. been a wonderful relationship I've had with Loyola. And I'm so proud of Loyola for being a Jesuit apostolate and, and get, putting out the good word for the Jesuits. So thanks so uh, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm from a t small town in uh, Louisiana called Church Point, a little tiny town, and kind of grew up as a Cajun and uh, everybody I knew, pr pretty much everybody I knew were Cajuns, and and it's a very Catholic setting. Uh, yeah. Most uh, Cajuns in Southwest Louisiana are Catholic, and so so it was very honestly like quite natural for me to sort of move from from Church Point into the Jesuits, which is what I did. It's a little unusual this time of uh, this this sort of period in our church history for for someone to enter the Jesuits at 18, but, yeah. but that's what I did. I went straight from my, my public high school into, into the Jesuits. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I've never looked back. It's been wonderful. It's been, I don't even know, 35 years or so. Wow. And, and I've had a wonderful, wonderful Jesuit life. I, I've had three big jobs, I would say. Uh, one was uh, in high school work, doing various jobs in high school work. The, the big one would be uh, the campus minister. Uh, I did that for nine years. And then I worked in our novitiates. I was the, okay. the director of our Jesuit novitiate, uh, which is in Southwest uh, Louisiana, not far from where I grew up. I did that for 11 years. And uh, now I am in my third career. We we sort of sometimes jokingly say every Jesuit has seven careers. So I'm on <laughs> career number three. And uh, I'm the pastor of, of, of a parish, of a big parish, in uptown New Orleans, which I absolutely love. I just, I'm just having a marvelous time being a parish priest. That is so wonderful. And that's one of the things that I uh, really admire about you, Father Mark, when I met you in person and <clears throat> got to listen to your presentation, just the, the joy you have for your ministry. It is, it's very obvious that you love what you're doing. Like you said, you haven't looked back and you exude that. Uh, you look like a person who, who, who you come across as a person who hasn't <laughs> looked back and is just, you know, hey, let's go. You know, let's go forward, moving ahead with, with your ministry. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for uh, telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and we're going to be drawing today from uh, one of the, the books that you've uh, written. You've written a few uh, over the years, but in particular, the, the, the book, God's Voice Within. 
And um, tell us a little bit uh, of, about this book and, and you know, what, what's the main thrust of it and, and how is it an inspiration for what we're going to do uh, in this webinar? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I wrote this book when I was the novice director for the Jesuits. And, and so my my work as a novice director was to to lead uh, men, mostly young men, through a two year discernment about whether or not they would take first vows in the Society of Jesus. So uh, when when I took over the job, the person who had the job before me said to me, uh, "Mark, your 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 profession now is discernment." You, that's that's your your full time profession is discernment, and that really struck me, and I, I found that to be very true. So I spent a great deal of time on Saint Ignatius's rules for discernment, which, as you know, Joe is is at the sort of back of the book of the spiritual exercises. They are okay. appendices, uh, two appendices in the back of the spiritual exercises, and what I found was. Well, I, I personally believe it's St. Ignatius's best work, his absolute best work is what he wrote in, in the two appendices called yeah. Rules for the Sermon of Spirits. Uh, however, I also found, Joe, that because it's, it was written in the 16th century, it's inaccessible to people who don't have any sort of background, any okay. theological background, or or have a lot of experience in reading that uh, a 16th century document. Sure. So, and 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 I did not find a huge quantity of books written in in our day that really spoke to to people of our day that that really kind of brought down the fire from the mountain, if okay. you will. And and so I tried to sort of make it very accessible with examples yeah. and so forth. Uh, I, I'm not a scholar. A lot of Jesuits are scholars. I'm not a scholar. What I see is my own personal gift is to take the scholarship and bring it to the people in the pews. And, and so that was my goal. Uh, and so so this is sort of a, a, a guide to to help people to to make prayerful decisions. I I believe that that most people through no fault of their own, they don't discern things, they decide things. Mm -hmm. And But most people would like to discern things. And and just a basic d distinction between those two might be to discern is to bring God into your decision, mm -hmm. to to to, uh, to decide something in dialogue mm -hmm. with, with our Savior. And so so this is to help people, help people in a, in a very concrete way to make day-by-day -day discernments and also the big ones as well. Well, and you do that very well, Father Mark, and I think that's one of the reasons uh, that your your message resonates, I know, with me and with so many other people. I'm not a scholar either. I've, I've always made that part of my introduction uh, to people. Um, I, I appreciate scholarship. I learn from scholarship. I sit at the feet of scholars, and then, like you said, we take that and we try to translate it in ways to, you know, everyday language. And and that's what you do so well. That's what hit me during your presentation that I was at in, in New Orleans, that you, you just, you speak everyday language and, and people appreciate that, but it's based on scholarship and it's drawn from scholarship. And that's so, so vitally important. Um, it, you said something that I thought was very important. You said that uh, most people, uh, decide rather than discern. Let, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and, you know, what, what kind of decisions and um, our discernment are, are we talking about? I mean, every day we wake up and decide what I should wear. That's a decision. I don't think I need to discern that, but <laughs> you know, maybe you can help differentiate that. And then as, as you're going through that also, Father Mark, and maybe you'll unpack this as we go a little further. When we talk about God's voice within, are, are, are we really listening for voices? I mean, am I going to hear someone say, hello, Joe? <laughs> so that's a lot to throw at you, but let's start unpacking all that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, you, you say it well on this, uh, on this slide that we're looking at here that I think a lot of Christians uh, are trying to figure out what they, what they should do and and of course that's important that we, we should live uh, as people of faith. We should we should uh, serve the underprivileged of the world and so forth. We, we should we should follow the instructions of the Bible, of course. So there are shoulds, of course, but but actually, 
what Saint Ignatius is talking about when he talks about discernment is he he calls it uh, a, a decision between two goods, mm. two goods. So he he says that. A, a decision between a good and a bad is not really a decision for a Christian. You just do the good and, and you avoid the bad. So that's pretty simple. So when we talk about discernment, we're not actually talking about what you should do. We're talking about what would what would be the for the greater glory of God. Mm. What, what would be what, what invitations is the Lord sending you? And I do think the Lord sends us invitations. There are some things the Lord let's say demands that we live justly for example and that we mm -hmm. that we we live without violence so forth and so forth so he does, god makes demands on us of course but uh, so many times god gives us invitations that we can say yes or no to and and so i think discernment uh, to a great extent is about sorting through and discerning distinguishing the the various invitations that the lord is is making to us and deciding which invitations the Lord would, would want for us. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, this this gets us to this notion that, that you talk about in the book uh, of, you know, the trying to discern spirits, to listen to, to what God is saying to us. And, and you talk about true and false spirits. And, and so I, I picked this picture here to show that, you know, you got voices going in, in, in one ear on the one side and in the other ear on the other. It's almost like the, the classic uh uh, picture of you know the, the little angel and a little devil uh, yes. not not like you said not necessarily a little, little devil it could be two different angels speaking <laughs> to us but you talk about this true and false spirit so uh, unpack this for us uh, about sure. what, what it is we're paying attention to right yeah i, I would say you know uh, and earlier you talked about you know what sort of discernments are we talking about uh, I think we can use discernment of spirits for the small, very small decisions in our life and for the great big ones too. Obviously, the, the great big ones are more important, but but the small ones are important too, because frankly, most of our life is made up of, of a billion small decisions. Mm -hmm. And when we wake up in the morning, from the very start of our morning, we get invitations. We get voices uh, calling us to do one thing or another. So my alarm will ring in the morning and I, I I hear one voice saying, okay, get up, put your feet on the floor and get going. I hear another voice saying, turn the alarm off and turn over. Uh, <laughs> and, and so already from the very start, from the first moment of consciousness, I'm getting an invitations. And that goes all the way up to the biggest decisions of my life. And St. Ignatius says that, that what we want to do is discern the source of those invitations which voice is calling us uh, to, to do one thing or another. And I'd like to unpack a little bit, what do I mean by true spirit and false spirit? Okay. And, and this is sort of, just to be fair, it's, it's my own take on St. Ignatius. So mm -hmm. my own take on St. Ignatius, my own interpretation. I like to say, and, and I like how you put on the slide here, uh, Joe, that the true spirits and the false spirits, because... It's really not the true spirit. A lot of people want to equate that with the Holy Spirit, okay. and they want to equate false spirit with Satan or the devil. Okay. And that's not bad, but it's not precise, in my opinion. Mm. It's not the best way to look at it. Okay. I would call the true spirits any movement inside of me, any internal movement inside of me that moves me towards God. Mm. So, so that could be, of course, the Holy Spirit, but it could also be you know, my good upbringing with my loving mother and father, that's a, the, the, the spirit that, that my, my mother and father instilled in me in that loving childhood, mm -hmm. that's a good spirit too that moves me towards God. Uh, and likewise, the false spirit, uh, the traditional term is evil spirit. I like to call it the false spirit to kind of get us a little bit away from the exact equation with Satan. Yeah. It's any spirit in an internal movement inside of me that moves me away from God. And that, of course, could be Satan, but it could also be, you know, my my stomach ache that's making me grouchy today, or, or yeah. it could be uh, a psychological mental health issue that I'm struggling with right now yeah. that's affecting my decisions. So it's all of those spirits, all of those spirits in both ways. And, and what I want to do when I'm when I'm discerning is I, I, I discern what is it I'm being invited to 
uh, and and who, what spirit, which spirit is sending the invitation? And oftentimes, Saint Ignatius and, and myself too anthropomorphizes the 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 call. So we we tend to use the metaphor of of a person speaking in our in our ear, and and we we. We use that, and we, and we will even say he, you know, the the, yeah. the false spirit, he tells us this, and he does this. Uh -huh. But we, we do want to keep in mind that that's a metaphor so that we can remember that it's any sort of movement within us. That, that's uh, I'm really glad you're clarifying that. And you even mentioned uh, a few seconds ago um, uh, mental health issues that, that we can be dealing with. I, I once was speaking, uh, giving a talk about some something similar to what you're talking about here. And during the break, a woman came up and she said she works with people with uh, mental health challenges. And she said this whole notion of Ignatian spirituality, as wonderful it is, as it is, can be very difficult for people with mental illness who sometimes hear voices. She was just very plain about that. And so you've used the word voices. You've also used the word movements maybe just say a little bit more about that what do you mean by a by a movement within us right I, i'm really glad you brought that up joe uh, for the most part uh even the word voice is a metaphor for what's going on that's not to say that the voice of god isn't always a voice it uh, isn't ever a voice sometimes it is a voice uh but most of the time it's not as a matter of fact and and I would say for me, I'm not sure that I ever heard an audible voice from God. I, I believe the saints when they say the, the mystics sometimes have heard that. But I think for most of us, what we mean when we say voice, we mean a sort of movement within us, a, a, a pull, a pull towards something. And, and perhaps even, I would say maybe a repulsion, a, a, a move, yeah. a pull away from something like I feel a repulse. I want to go away from that or, or I feel drawn towards. So it, it's it's actually to, it, to if we were to be more accurate, I would say it's more of an internal movement or or, or an emotion, you know, emo, emotion towards a desire for or sort of a repulsion, uh, a, a repulsion from a particular uh, movement or behavior. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, you know, in a sense, it almost sounds like you're saying that that we we hear God's voice with with our gut, and that that's yes. not that's not to say just go with your gut. Pay attention to your gut. Is that kind of a way of putting it? Absolutely, yeah. And so, so the craft of of discernment of spirits is to get better and better at at sort of sensing inside of you the movements of your heart just having a a sense of the of the pulls and pushes inside of you uh you know i jokingly i jokingly say that i wrote a book uh, on discernment before i wrote god's voice within that no one will ever see because i i sort of buried it and the reason why i, I started out writing a book called nine steps to a good decision and the idea my my idea was to you follow these steps. Step one, you do this. Step two, you do that. Step three. And, and the idea would be that by the time you got to step nine, you, you will have the decision made. So I, I wrote a large chunk of that of that manuscript. And then I had to make a big discernment myself as novice director. So I said, I'm going to take it out for a spin. And I, I employed the steps myself. And it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, and, and so it taught me that, no, discernment is not really... Uh, you can't really reduce it down to mm -hmm. steps. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's actually more of getting what I like to call an Ignatian intuition, a, 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 an Ignatian intuition. Our intuition is is a gut sense inside of us. And an Ignatian intuition would be uh, sensing these these movements inside of us uh, away from or towards something. And, and so we call that, I like to call that Ignatian intuition. Mm -hmm. And and so you're uh, of course using language from Saint Ignatius, and you take that further when you talk about uh, paying attention to these spirits 
uh, you borrow the language of Ignatius when he talks about the desolation and consolation. And uh, so when we talk about the, the false spirits, you use the word desolation. Why don't you take us into this a little bit? And uh, again, using the language that you just provided us with, how do we pay attention to these pulls, pull, pushes, repulsions, movements, and, and so on? Right, sure. So uh, desolation, what, what we want to do is discern what sort of state am I in? and which uh, of the two spirits are sort of prominent in my in my movements, in my interior movements at the time. To go back to our metaphor of voice, which, which spirit is sort of speaking to me at the moment? One way I like to put it is, I'm in the state of desolation when I am, uh, when I have a DUI, driving under the influence of, of the false spirit. So it means that that the invitations of the false spirit, the, the movements inside of me that are leading me away from God are, are, uh, are, are prominent right now. Those are the prominent voices okay. inside of me. And, and, and so that's what desolation is. And of course, consolation is the opposite when I'm driving under the influence of the good spirit, the, the movements inside of me that moves me towards uh, good actions and, and, and towards God. So a lot of our work of discernment and notice I'm not even moving to discernment of choices yet. That we have to discern the spirits before we discern the choices. So okay. well, first we discern what are the spirits inside of me? What are they saying? What are the invitations inside of me? And what state am I in? And so first we discern, am I in desolation or consolation? And what you see here on the screen are what, what I would say are the, the primary indicators of desolation. Uh, now, this is not a perfect craft. It's not mm -hmm. scientific. It's more of a gut. So, okay. so we can't take this uh, too literally. We need to get a sense of things. So in general, I'm in desolation when I, I'm not feeling a great desire for faith, hope, and love. Uh, okay. So for example, maybe fear has got the best of me. So instead of feeling a great desire to do something bold and loving, I feel instead a desire to run. Uh, mm. And 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 so so that's one indication that I, my my flame of faith, hope, and love. St. Ignatius says that that a, a healthy Christian is going to be filled up with faith, hope, and love, going to be okay. filled with a great desire for faith, hope, and love. Uh, and so the next one is the sense of God's being close to me. And notice I wrote the sense of God's being close to me because God is always close to us, Good. but we don't always sense God's close presence. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it, it, it feels as though God is, is distant. And so that might be another indication that I'm in desolation. Okay. Uh, and then these others uh, are other indicators the first two are the major indicators and then these other four are sort of secondary indicators a sense of disquietude within me mm -hmm. St. Ignatius that's a word from D Ignatius disquietude means mm -hmm. that uh, my heart is not at peace that there, there's okay. a sort of sense of of a, a, a sort of anxiety or restlessness or some kind of uh, anything but peace in in, in my the depths of my heart Mm -hmm. boredom and tepidity saint ignatius was a very fired up kind of guy and he and he felt like christians at their best when when they're having a good day when they're in consolation they're actually fired up mm -hmm. I, I think with mary uh when she says my soul magnifies the lord like she's she's just filled up with great desires yeah. you know? and and so the opposite would be boredom and tepidity like uh, perhaps uh, an example would be Koheleth from uh, Ecclesiastes, okay. you know, when he, he, he's sort of in the dumps, down in the dumps, and he says, you know, all is vanity, and, mm -hmm. and he just sort of feels almost like in despair. Yeah. In fear and worry. St. Ignatius says that that one of the greatest tools, one of the biggest tools of the false spirit is fear and worry, and okay. we all know how how much damage fear and worry can do in our hearts and finally secrecy this is a telltale sign that that uh when we feel disinclined to talk to some of the people that god has put in our lives 
who are who are the important people in our lives who we normally would be our go-to person joe, joe I, I think you're you're married are you not uh, yes mm -hmm. so, 42 so years probably, 42 years okay so so you know your wife i'm sure is your go-to person you you're yeah. just inclined to tell her everything exactly. and and if there's just even even the slightest indication of 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 a of a invitation to not tell her something that, that that might be an indication that you're in a state of desolation great example and it, it takes us to the uh scriptural examples of you know uh, uh, marriage as a, a metaphor and so that very often we look at a relationship a close relationship and that helps us to understand how do we relate to god i love the fact that you also mentioned that before i go to the next slide uh, boredom and tepidity because uh you know i think in, in so many ways many people are saying well i'm not feeling any strong feelings of, of you know repulsion or anything I say, i'm not feeling anything i'm just feeling sort of meh. <laughs> you know right that's exactly right sometimes i call it uh i'm i'm delighted to say loyola press published a sort of second book for me for uh, on discernment uh and in that book uh ignatian discernment of spirits going deeper i talk about uh dramatic desolation versus what i call placid desolation ah, so okay desolation can be dramatic i can be in great uh, fear, just filled up with fear or anxiety or anger, and, and it's very dramatic. Or it could be, in a way, the opposite. It could be flatlined, mm. because Ignatius believes that a Christian is not flatlined. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're filled up with great desires normally. So, so yeah, it can be, instead of great anger or fear, it could be boredom. Boredom could be an indication of that, so... I, and it reminds me of a scripture passage, and, and maybe you or some of our uh, hundreds of people can help me identify where this is from. But uh, I believe it's in the Old Testament where God says, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And it's like, yes. that's always struck me as such a powerful uh, message to us. Um, and so, yeah, maybe someone in the chat can tell us that, where that's from. That's um, from the book of Revelation. Yeah, is it Revelation? Yes. Okay. Good yes, for you. Jesus I thought it was is, Old Testament. Yeah. Christ is speaking to the different towns. Okay. And he says to one of the towns, he says, how I wish you were one or the other, mm. hot or cold. Mm. And, but because you were lukewarm, I will spew you from my mouth. San Ignatius, he never talked about that passage, but he would love that passage because <laughs> Ignatius really believed that even like a dramatic desolation is better than a placid desolation. The, the worst thing of all is no movement at all. Okay. Because even with dramatic desolation, you can use those emotions for the good. But if there's no wind at all in your sails, yeah. that's that's kind of the, the, the worst case scenario. That's very powerful. Uh, folks, we're about at the halfway point. We're talking with Father Mark Thibodeau uh, about uh, listening to God's voice within. Thank you for being with us. And a number of you have gone to the Q&A to put in some questions, because in just about 15 minutes, we're going to switch over to do some Q&A with uh, Father Mark. Uh, but let's move on, Father Mark, and talk a little bit more about the uh, consolation. And I think we can kind of see from uh, uh, what's on the screen and what you were telling us kind of flip you know the, the the script here right yes absolutely ignatius says very clearly that consolation is the opposite of desolation so if you know one you sort of know the other it's simply the opposite so so you see again some of the same things that consolation is a is a is a filled up with desires for faith hope and love uh, and it's it's having a strong sense that god is close to you and instead of disquietude, you have a sense of peace and tranquility. Now, right here, I want to stop and say, it may be you, you're nervous and, and a little scared on the surface, like a person about to get married, for example, or a person about to enter the seminary, something like that. You would be ner or start a new job. You might be nervous, but deep, deep down in, your, in, your, in the depths of your soul, there's a sense of peace and tranquility. Okay. Uh, and and then uh, having great desires. Ignatius believed that desires were a strong indication, uh, something that we can really have a good sense of where we are spiritually by desires, because he himself was filled up with such great desires. And what do I mean by great? I mean desires for faith, hope, and love, desires to live out the virtues. Uh, and then finally, transparency. You notice that that's in juxtaposition to secrecy. Huh? So 
So if you, Joe, with your with your wonderful wife, you feel yourself inclined to share with your wife or to share with your spiritual director or your therapist yeah. or anybody that you feel is a good person in your life, if you feel moved towards sharing whatever's going on, that's an indication perhaps that you're in consolation. Yeah, and I love that you just even threw in the word therapist just a few minutes ago as though, you know, it's not a dirty word, that this is part of our our discernment. Many people turn to professionals. Uh, can you just say a word about that, uh, how you feel about that whole notion? Yes, I, I feel very strongly that, that therapists can be a, a wonderful part of an integrated Christian life. Uh, uh, I feel that very strongly that, you know, if my cholesterol is high, I'm going to go to the doctor. And if, if I have some issue with my mental health, then I need to go to the doctor. I need to go, go to a professional. And, and I think therapists can work in lockstep with, with uh, a spiritual director and with your sister or, or father, your priest or, or nun. You know, the therapy can be a wonderful part of, of this whole spiritual journey. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's a question that's on many people's minds. And and I think it leads us into this next notion of, you know, so how do we respond? You know, it's one thing to discern, identify things, but then it has to lead to some kind of action. And so you provide us with some uh, thoughts about how do we respond to desolation? I, I love the image that you use uh, about the uh, fire extinguisher. You want to tell us what this is all about? Yes. So sometimes when we're in desolation, Sometimes we feel inclined uh, to do nothing, uh, or, or to put it another way, sometimes we're sort of paralyzed by our desolation. And St. Ignatius felt strongly that, no, when you're in desolation, that's actually the time that you break the glass of the, of the fire extinguisher. It's the time when you, you need to get to work, frankly, and you, you, you need to push yourself to work. You know, when you're in consolation, Work comes easy because you have that great desire to do great acts of faith, hope, and love. So work just comes naturally to a person in consolation. When you're in desolation, it's almost the opposite. If you're if you are filled with fear or anxiety, it paralyzes you. And so you freeze, or maybe you run the opposite direction. Or if you're in boredom or in tepidity, then uh, you just you just don't have the energy. Uh, and so St. Ignatius says you have to sort of rouse yourself. Rouse yourself and, and get to work. Break the glass and, and get to work to put out the fire. Uh, just to give you a few uh, notions from the book about what things you can do in desolation. And, and to be honest with you, I feel like this is one of the more important parts of the book because uh, everyone needs a little help with desolation, right? Uh, you don't need as much help with consolation because consolation, you, you're already moving with the spirit. Yeah. You're in step with, with the spirit. So you don't need quite as much help in consolation, but everybody needs help with desolation. So I think this is a, a part of the book that I would recommend people sort of spend some time with. Sure. And just to give you a few examples of things that you can do when you're in desolation. Number one, I advise people to really lean on what I call their support network. And what do I mean by support network? I mean, lean on uh, the people in your life that God has placed in your life that help you to be the person that you are to be. Number one would be your spouse if you're married, I would say, but then your spiritual director, your therapist, a good friend who who helps you to be the person you're you're meant to be, perhaps your parish priest or your advisor, all of those sort of things. And all, included in the spiritual network, I would include also the church, including the teachings of the church, the catechisms and 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 the rituals of the church. All of that I would call your spiritual network. I think you need to lean more on your spiritual network when you are in desolation. Uh, to put it another way, if you are at a party and you've had uh, a little too much to drink, then you're going to turn over the keys to someone else. Okay. Uh, well, if you're in desolation, sometimes you have to take your car keys mm -hmm. and hand it to someone else. So, so just if, you, if you're in a bad space, Joe, and, and just not in a, in a healthy emotional space, you may say to your wife, you know what, I'm going to let you lead in this conversation that we're in mm -hmm. with our, our son or daughter or whatever, because I'm not in a great space. I think you're in a better space. So uh, those are examples. That's a concrete example of what I mean by that. 
I love that example of the the car keys. That that is just very powerful. And uh, I love what you said too about the notion of uh, you know we need to break the glass when it comes to desolation, and, and when it's consolation, you know we it, it feels like well okay we're doing fine. What, what what why do we have to do anything? And you use a great image about uh, going to the doctor. You want to unpack that for us a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So so I, I kind of use this humorous example of like it, it sort of feels on the one hand on the surface we might say well there's no reason to seek spiritual help when you're in consolation because that would be like going to the doctor and saying hey doctor what what should i do with all this good health i've been having lately you know i think the doctor would say well just go live right just go live. so to some extent consolation you can just go live uh in a way spiritual advisors and spiritual counselors are more important in the time of desolation because you can, St. Ignatius puts it this way. St. Ignatius says, when you're in consolation, the good spirit is whispering in your ear, the good spirit. So you can sort of trust the movements inside of yourself. So that's on the one hand. But if you go deeper, uh, you actually do go to the doctor, don't you? Even when you're healthy, don't don't we go for checkups, right? Yep. And, and and we do actually do preventative uh, medicine, preventative therapy, of uh, uh, physical therapy, and so forth, when we are in good health. And in the same way, in our spiritual lives, we want to do the same with consolation. So, so here's a few things that you might want to do when you're in consolation. Uh, number one, I would say, is to simply relish, relish the wonderful graces that God has given you. You know, there's the wonderful story of the 10 lepers uh, who, are, uh, who are given this grace of healing, and nine of them go away, and the tenth returns to give thanks to, to the Lord. And he gets a double blessing. The Lord blesses him again. And so it, it, in, in consolation, we return to the place where we were blessed by God nice. to get a double blessing. Huh? That's what we do. We relish what's going on. Uh, uh, that's when we're in consolation. The other thing we want to do is, uh, is to sort of journal write down yeah. the good things that are happening. And why do I say that? Because you can use this when you're in desolation. Again, you can use this time of consolation. When you're in desolation, a lot of times you begin to catastrophize, right? And you say, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm going to feel this way for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's, that's a lie of the false spirit. Huh? And if you have in writing the moment of consolation, if you have that in writing, then uh, you can go back and say, no, it's not true, actually. This is a temporary moment in my life. Mm -hmm. And finally, the, perhaps the big thing, St. Ignatius says that when you're in consolation, you want to prepare for desolation. That sounds a little bit mm -hmm. morbid, but it, I don't think it's morbid. I think it's what we would now call preventative health. Huh? Okay. And so when we're in good spirits, when we're in good health, that's when we go for a run in the park. Huh? That's okay. when we do our exercises and and we we kind of push ourselves perhaps with physical exercise and so forth. And in the same way, when we're in consolation, that's when we sort of sort of build our spiritual muscle. Huh? When we kind of push ourselves a little bit and and sort of go back and look at the last moment of desolation and say, what can I do to build my defenses for the next moment when that when that when that uh, desolation comes back again, so so preparing for desolation, even though it sounds morbid, I don't think it has to be morbid. It's simply it's simply doing some good preventative medicine for yourself in, in a spiritual way. Yeah, and I love what you said about you. Even when we're healthy, we go for a checkup, and sometimes the doctor will will find something that is not uh, visible to us. They take a blood test and say your cholesterol is high. Well, we can't tell that from day to day, and so they give us medication to prevent something from happening. So that that's just a great example, um, folks. We're about. Uh, Oh, five minutes away from doing some Q and A, and so I'm just giving you a little uh, alert here, uh, Father Mark, as well. That don't be surprised if I skip over a couple of things because we have a huge audience here, and we have dozens of questions piling up in the Q and A. I really want to make sure we give time, but 
so I, I'm going to um, offer this next one and then perhaps uh, skip over anything. So if there's anything that, that you really want to say, just say, Joe, I want to make this point. <laughs> all right. Okay. But one of the things that, that you talk about is this idea of all of this that you have said so far is about laying a foundation. Uh, and I, again, another metaphor. You, you're so good at these metaphors. Tell us what you're thinking about in terms of a foundation for us in terms of our decisions in our lives. Right. Yeah. So, so the 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 thing I definitely want to get to before we go to Q and A, which by the way I love Q and A, so I'm, I'm, I don't want us to 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 uh, take away from it. Uh, so the thing I want to get to, and the thing that's most important is that. Uh, We've been talking about discernment of spirits and and how do we transition from discernment of spirits to discernment of choices? Okay. And so first we talk about discernment of spirits. We lay a foundation. We 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 build a sense of our Ignatian intuition so that we get okay. to a place where we start to sense the different movements of the spirits so that when it comes time to make a good decision in, in prayer, which we call discernment, uh, then we have that foundation. We can uh, we're already ready to sort of sense which mm -hmm. movements are pulling us one way or another. And and just to to jump yeah there you go thank you to jump straight to the to the meat of it. This is what we can do a a, a, a very simple formula for getting to uh, deciding uh, choices in our life. First we get ourselves quiet. We get in a prayerful state. We gather all the data that we can, of course, that's sort of sort of a logical thing. We, we gather as much information as we can. Uh, and then we we dream dreams. St. Ignatius of Loyola was a daydreamer. He loved to, to sort of have these wonderful daydreams. Uh, he, he would dream of being a knight uh, in a court, and then he would dream about being a saint. And he would have these two daydreams, and then he would ponder the dreams. Okay, which... Which spirit is really driving the dream about me being a, a knight uh, in shining armor? And which which spirit is is driving the dream of me becoming a saint? And mm. that's how he came to decide to become ultimately uh, a Catholic priest and and the founder of religious order. It, it, he 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 pondered these daydreams. I like to call this pray dreaming. You get into your prayer and you allow yourself to daydream. Option A, option B, you daydream your, it, within those two options, and you sort of get a sense of, use your Ignatian intuition to see which movement, which voice is pulling me one way or another. And you, of course, you go towards the, the pull uh, that you've discerned to be the good spirit. Yeah, and it's actually uh, today, I think, in a lot of professional circles, they, they talk about visioning and envisioning yourself. I know they use this in sports, you know, envision yourself, uh, you know, in the game. How are you going to react to it in leadership and so on? So it's just new language for something that St. Ignatius was talking about uh, centuries ago. Uh, maybe the last thought before we, uh, we bring Denise on uh, is when I make a decision then, um, Am I done? Oh, good question. <laughs> so Ignatius would encourage, and I would say every Ignatian, uh, every Ignatian promoter would, would say the same here. We're, we're all sort of in agreement that for big decisions, what you want to do is make an offering to the Lord. He says, I offer this decision to God. And, and so he would call that a tentative decision. Uh, so of course, sometimes you have no time, right? If there's a deadline or something. But if you have the time, you, you come to a tentative decision and you make that offering to God. You offer it to God in your heart, in your prayer. You say, Lord, this is the decision I think you want me to, to go towards. And then you, you await confirmation. What does confirmation look and feel like? Well, it feels much the same. It feels like as you move towards this decision, as you start to enact the first little preparatory steps of moving towards option A versus option B, there's just this deep sense of, of peace in your heart, a sense of transparency with the people whom you love and so forth. You, those same feelings of consolation come back again. And that would be the, the confirmation that we're seeking uh, that, that could move us from a tentative decision to to a final decision. So it sounds in many ways like a cycle that this, you know, we just, we're back where we started in terms of the tools that we're yeah. going to turn to, uh, to go forward. Um, 
great job, Father Mark. You got that all in uh, under the gun there because I really, like I said, I, I'm going to skip past one thing. We That's all we're missing there, but it's in the book. So, folks, <laughs> and Denise has uh, appeared. She's been working hard behind the scenes here, getting tons of questions, and she's sifting through them to, uh, to offer them. So without further ado, Denise, let's get into Q&A with Father Mark. Okay, great. Uh, Johannes asks, what advice would you give for overcoming perfectionism in discernment? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Wonderful question. Uh, so one of the things that St. Ignatius talks about is, he says in, in those rules for discernment of spirits, he says, you want to know uh, where where is the weak spot in, in both your psyche and your soul? So he says that the false spirit is sort of uncreative when it comes to coming after us. The false spirit is going to use the same line of attack again and again and again. And so one of the things we want to discern, that foundation that, that Joe and I talked about, is discern what are the sort of weak spots? What are my vulnerabilities? So one vulnerability might be uh, perfectionism, huh? that, that we... We want so badly to be uh, to have everything just right uh, before, or maybe in making a decision, we want certainty before we decide that it actually paralyzes us. Huh? And so if we have discerned that this is one of the, what Ignatius might call the chink in the armor, the, the, the hole in the fortress wall where the false spirit keeps coming at me, then how can we counteract perfectionism? So I would say one way would be, I like to, I use these two things, like some people are hasty discerners and some people are hesitant discerners. A perfectionist tends to be a hesitant discerner. They, they tend to discern too long. They, they take too long. And so my advice is actually that with the help of perhaps your spiritual director or your spouse or something, you set a deadline. You set a deadline. You say, by this time, I'm going to make this decision. And whether or not it's a perfect decision, I'm going to give that to God. I'm going to turn that over to God. But on this date, I will make a decision. And that way we don't get lost in, in, the, in the desert of, uh, of just constant churning, churning, churning. That's one of the ways we can work with perfectionism, I think. I love how uh, you continue to, to mention, you know, not just spiritual directors and not just therapists, but spouse, good friends, and so on, that there's so many people we can turn to for this kind of help. And uh, I think that's deeply appreciated by so many folks. Denise, next one. Okay. Donna says that she finds whenever she has an amazing spiritual day and knows she's in consolation, she finds the next day is completely different and feels almost in desolation. How do we handle this up and down of movements of the spirits and what can I do to diminish the low feelings? Wow, wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, St. Ignatius does talk about that oftentimes desolation uh, sort of comes quickly on the heels of consolation. Uh, one of the things uh, that we can do, that's some of the work that we wanna do in consolation. So when we're in consolation, we can start to sort of, uh, let's say, mentally acknowledge uh, and acknowledge in our prayer that that we're on a mountain right now, and and sort of tell myself, okay, we're gonna. There's gonna be a moment, and the moment might be soon when I'm gonna come down from the mountain, and uh, and 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 if we do that, if we sort of know it, the the worst thing about it is when it blindsides us. So if we see it coming from a distance. I think we can sort of prepare ourselves. And when that moment comes, then we say, okay, yeah, this is this is typical. This is this is just part of the the spiritual ups and downs of my life. Uh and and, and it doesn't hit so hard, you know. And I think too, you know, that it's obvious that, you know, all of us carry different kinds of baggage with us and many of us have uh integrated messages within us that are not healthy and so sometimes when good things are happening we immediately tell ourselves i don't deserve this and so yeah. desolation comes creeping right back in so it's it's good to have these tools that you're offering us to be aware of those and how to respond to them great questions let's continue okay um this is by an anonymous attendee who mentions the examine and has heard it referred to in helping us discern our interior movements. 
how does the examine relate to discernment? Wonderful. So I, I like to call the Ignatian examine real-time discernment, real-time discernment. And by that, I mean, the examine is meant to be, Ignatius says, about a quarter of an hour. So he wants it to be very short. Uh, and I think it could be as short as five or 10 minutes even. I think the beauty of the Ignatian examine is that it's very, very short. And you're meant to do it right embedded in your day. So maybe on your lunch break, for example, you do a little five, 10 minute examine. And if you do that, I would say that an examine is, is nothing more than discerning the spirits for 10 or 15 minutes. So I work in the office all morning long. Now it's my lunch break. I eat my sandwich and then I have just a quiet moment before I go back in my office. And I say, where's my spirit here? Where's my spirit? Am I in desolation or consolation? Uh, did I, did I sort of was a little grumpy with my coworkers or, or, or am I feeling just a great desire for faith, hope, and love? And if I'm feeling that, then I ask the Lord to, 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 to help me go even further. If I'm feeling a bit of desolation, then I pray for the grace uh, to, to, to move, move maybe a little bit more cautiously through my afternoon. So the Ignatian examine is a wonderful way to do real-time discernment right there embedded in your day. Real-time discernment, folks. You heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> Father Mark, we're going to have to have the, Denise in our marketing department get, start making <laughs> buttons with some of these phrases that you have. These are just, I love it, real-time discernment. Uh, let's continue, Denise. Okay. Is a time of quiet grief or a pause a time of desolation? Is the distinction truly whether am I, I am feeling that faith, hope, and love even if I'm in grief or a pause in desire, and he's sharing the example of a transition to retirement. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we we brought this up because it's one thing we have not talked about yet, and it's that you know if you look up desolation in a dictionary, it's going to talk about feeling bad, uh, and if you talk about if you look up consolation in a in a Merriam-Webster dictionary, it's going to talk about feeling good. Uh, spiritual desolation and consolation is a bit more complicated than that. Usually in consolation, we feel good. And usually in desolation, we feel bad, but not always. And so sometimes we're in consolation, but we don't feel great. And you you brought up whoever the questioner was, was the, they brought up a great example of grief. So uh, if if someone has been married for years and years and was always in love with their spouse and they lose their spouse, the, the spouse dies, they'll be in grief, but they won't necessarily be in desolation. How do we know? Well, if they're in grief, but they still feel faith, hope, and love. They still feel this great desire for faith, hope, and love. And in the midst of their grief, maybe they'll have terrible sadness, terrible sadness, but they feel that God is very close to them. Well, that's actually consolation, not desolation. In my second book uh, on desolation with Loyola Press, the one called Going Deeper, uh, I call that uh, difficult consolation. I think there's such a thing as difficult consolation that, or, or perhaps, you know, you're the leader of an organization and you have to take the organization through a very difficult moment uh, and, and it's painful and you feel the pain of it. But but you know that you're doing God's will and you feel great desire for faith, hope, and love. You feel God is near you. So so that's another example of perhaps difficult consolation. That that's a great uh, description of that. I just had a saw a friend of mine on Facebook who uh, lost her husband uh, suddenly, tragically, um, after not being married that long either. And she was saying how this happened three years ago, and she thought she was done with it, but it came, you know, it hit her on the anniversary, and she found herself sobbing again. That difficult consolation, that, that's something to really stop and think about. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we have time for a couple more, Denise. Great. Um, Deanne asks, do you have any suggestions for how to begin speaking to children about hearing the voice of God or practices we can do with them so they start to become aware of God's presence moving within them at a younger age? Wow, that's that's a great question. Uh, let me let me say one thing that I would I would strongly recommend that you not do. And that's uh, you, you really, in my opinion, you kind of want to steer away from uh, the talk of evil spirit or, or anything like that, because 
uh, because I think you could frighten children and and uh, and unnecessarily frighten them. Uh, we believe that God is the God of the universe and God has already won the great victory. Huh? So of course we need to look out uh, for evil in the world, but uh, but we really want to focus on on Christ and on Christ's victory in our lives and, and over the universe. Uh, so th that would be one one precaution I would take. Uh, yes, I don't know. I, I suppose with with children uh, to simply, a lot of people have found that there that the examine is a very easy thing for children uh, to do actually if led by an adult. We do it at our parochial school uh, and we we have the three step one of the things that we use is a three step process. It, it's uh, uh, wow, pow, and how. And so we say, wow, like wow, Lord, what how has God been present in your life? So that's wow. Pow is like, oh, when you get a hit, you know, when you when you take a hit, oh, what, what is hurting right now? And then uh, how is, okay, what 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 challenges do we have this afternoon or tomorrow? So perhaps maybe the entry point for, for children would be to go through this, this a very simple ch children's version of the, of the Ignatian examine. There's another button, <laughs> those three words, <laughs> I love, I love, love that it. One. And of course, all of our uh, curriculum uh, at Loyola Press, especially our Finding God curriculum, is all about uh, helping children to get in touch with uh, their spiritual life and uh, discerning. We don't use that word so much with them until they're a little bit older, uh, but being in touch with uh, how God is speaking to them uh, and how they can be aware of God's presence. Uh, let's uh, have time for one more, Denise. Okay. Robin wants to know, are desolation and the dark night of the soul related? Okay, so uh, in my opinion, uh, the dark night of the soul is not necessarily desolation. Th there are other people, practitioners of the Ignatian way, who would say that they are, are very similar, or maybe the same thing. I would argue that uh, St. John of the Cross is is kind of our, our go-to person for Dark Night of the Soul. And, and John of the Cross, I think, would say that, that the Lord leads you into the Dark Night of the Soul. And Ignatius says that God does not lead you into desolation. Uh, Ignatius would say that God allows desolation, but God doesn't lead you into desolation. So I wouldn't at all equate those two. Honestly, if you're in a dark night of the soul that is being led by the Holy Spirit, I actually would be more inclined to call that difficult consolation. One of the examples of difficult consolation, when, when God is leading you to great acts of faith, hope, and love, but without the feelings of faith, hope, and love. So that's one example that... Uh, it's a it's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit more difficult because the normal feelings of consolation aren't there. So you might not he quite feel the great desires of faith, open love, and yet you feel yourself walking in those steps uh, anyway. Uh, I, the go-to example of that, a modern day example, and this is my own take on it, my own personal take on it, but Mother Teresa of Calcutta, St. Teresa of Calcutta, I would argue that perhaps she was in difficult consolation because to say that she was in desolation would mean that that uh, she was sort of responding to movements moving her away from God. And I just that the, all of the evidence points to the opposite, that she was a person with great acts of faith, hope and love all the time. So I would say call that uh, difficult consolation. I think that's a great example. I was thinking of uh, St. Mother Teresa as you were talking about that, because I think that that worried a lot of us when we heard that about her uh, describing in her writings how she had this period of dryness, um, but that it could be a, a difficult consolation. Um, to borrow one of your three words, wow. Uh, this has been an extraordinary experience and, and uh, wow to all the people who submitted questions and Denise for sorting through them. Thank you, Denise for uh, doing that for us and Father Mark for, for taking all those questions and answering them. Uh, wish we had time for more, but it is time for us to, 
to, to thank everyone and to say goodbye. And uh, let me start by thanking you, Father Mark, for taking this time with us and uh, ask you to just share a, a, a final word with us about uh, this whole idea of listening for God's voice within. Yes. Uh, maybe a final word would be God is the God of the universe and, and the Lord has won the victory. And, and so, uh, and God is a God of consolation. Huh? So, so even when we're in the, the darkest despair, if we're in desolation, we need to remind ourselves that our God reigns and our God has already won the great victory. And, and so we have nothing to fear uh, as long as we're in the arms of the Lord and we are always in the arms of the Lord. What an incredibly uplifting and powerful message, Father Mark. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, uh, helping us to listen to God's voice within these movements, pushes, repulsions, all the different words that you used. Uh, so helpful to all of us. Uh, folks, the, the book is on your screen. Uh, by Father Mark, God's Voice Within, the Ignatian Way to Discover God's Will. There's a QR code right there for you if you'd like to scan that, so it'll take you right to information uh, about acquiring the book. Uh, also, you can go to store.loyolapress.com, and you can also call our customer service, 800-621-1008, and if you call during business hours, speak to a real live human being. Uh, who's going to answer that phone. And a reminder, a recording of this uh, wonderful webinar will be available soon. A link sent to each of you who participated, but also available at ignatianspirituality.com. Thanks again, Father Mark. Thank you to all of our participants. And until next time, God bless. God bless. Thank you.